I have been asked by my viewer <clears throat> to do a story about my Rolex watch. Now, for those of you who have come to Forex Overland because you thought you would get lots of four-wheel drive and expedition videos, well, you're wrong. Well, you'll get a lot of that, but you'll also get a few other things too. This is one of those other things. People have noticed, many people have noticed, and many have commented about my watch, my Rolex. 1981, I was working for a company called James Garrett and Partners. It's a film production company, and I was a junior assistant editor. And one of my jobs, tasks, was to keep the diary up to date and help my editor fulfill her responsibilities and to arrive at meetings on time. Except I didn't have a watch. Uh, for a few years, I didn't have a watch. And eventually, my boss, Mark, his name was Mark, he got a bit ticked off with me and he said, Andrew, you need to go and buy yourself a watch. And he was, get a watch. Of course, in those days, we didn't have mobile phones. So, how do you tell the time? You phone the time, or you ask somebody the time, or you miss your appointment, or you buy a watch. I said, okay. I'll go and buy a watch. Now at the time, my very close friend, still very close friend, lives in Cape Town by the name of Dirk. He loved National Geographic magazines and he had a whole pile of them. I used to go over to his place and perv over the Rolex advertisements on the back of the National Geographic magazines. And boy, I mean, I just dreamt about, for years and years, dreamt about owning a Rolex, a Rolex oyster. And we would discuss what the word oyster means. And it means that the entire case is actually honed out of a single piece of steel or whatever it's made from. The idea of owning one of these things, just absolutely fantastic. And then I met George. George was a freelance camera operator, cinematographer that the company used for their work. And he wore on his wrist a stainless steel Rolex Submariner date. And of course, I couldn't keep my eyes off it. It was the first one that I had actually met. And one day I asked him if I could have a look at it. And he handed it over and then offered to tell me the story about it. He was diving one day on a wreck and he looked down, he said, saw on the bed of the, the seabed something that wasn't natural. Yes, that's the story. And he went down, picked it up, and it was obviously a wristwatch. So he took it up to the boat, and on the boat, he said that the entire strap was solid. There was no more flex in it. It was encrusted in barnacles and all kinds of sea life. And he scraped with his fingernail the watch glass and looked in, and it was ticking. And that watch had been rebuilt by Rolex for him, new strap, new glass, new bezel, and he had it on his wrist. That story was enough for me. It is exactly 37 years to the day that this video is being released on YouTube, and here is the invoice here. Let me put this value in context. I paid 604 Rand for it. Its retail price was 711. 711 then was definitely more than a month's salary for your average 21 year old. I probably wasn't your average 21 year old. Uh, so maybe it was a month and a half salary for an average 21 year old. Uh, for me, it was even 604. I was probably earning about that every month. Today, for me to buy one, it would be, um, yes, more than my monthly salary, definitely. And I am a grown-up with dependents. So I reckon if I, realistically speaking, it's double the cost, the price that it was in real terms in 1981. So I got myself a watch. To get to work. I said, Mark, I bought myself a watch. I said, hand it over. So, took it off, handed it to him. And I get the look on his face, he just, 
<laughs> and I remember running out of the office and saying, Andrew's bought a watch. It was like well known in the company now. And I suppose we had about 12 employees in the company, maybe 15. Andrew's bought himself a watch. Hey! And guess what? It's a expletive Rolex. <laughs> oh dear, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. It was this very watch. I think if I think about it, my only prized possession. No, I do have another one. I do have a, I do have another. I only have one other prized possessions. And that's it. <laughs> it's called a Cardinal 66 fishing reel. And I got this when I was about 16 years old. And I still use it as my fishing reel. And it's made by a company called Abu. And in those days, they were made in Sweden. And they were amongst the best fishing bits of tackle in the world. And I still have it. And it's just pure, pure quality. So it is a, it is a prized possession. And if I look back at when I bought it, I mean, the idea of having this watch that was so fitting, I think, with my character, I wanted to, at, the, at that time, desperately wanted to sail around the world. And I wanted to travel across deserts. And Tom Shepard, who had just crossed the Sahara, and, I, and I, uh, Tom became a mentor, writer of four-wheel drive books, and, and, and all of these things, all associated with this product. Now, I, I'm not brand, I'm, I'm not a fanboy. I really work very hard not to be a fanboy of any brand. If I am a fanboy of any brand, it's Rolex. And it's because of this experience I've had with the watch, this watch. There are two stories, and if I think back, there, I, was, I, would, I behaved terribly during the early times, uh, the early few uh, weeks or months that I owned this watch. And I want to share two of them with you now. When I was in grade 11, yeah, I had an English teacher, and I didn't like him much. In fact, none of the teachers liked me. And his name was Mr. McNeil. He's passed away now. But I wasn't a very good student, academically poor, and I uh, wasn't a sporty, so I wasn't popular. And uh, I, I, I really struggled at school because I really worked quite hard and I couldn't get anywhere. And in grade 11, we were given a, a, a homework for end of term marks, write a essay that might appear at the, in the Time magazine or Newsweek magazine about the year's events. And I start set two and I showed it to my father to give me some pointers. Now at the time my father basically was Reuters senior correspondent for Southern Africa and had been for several years. He knew a little bit about the subject. Highly acclaimed journalist. He said to me, very nice, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? He said, why don't you take that middle piece that you've summarized there and point it in, put it in point form. It's good practice, it breaks the copy, it makes it easier to digest in an essay. If that's what they want, an essay, it's a, it's a very good journalistic practice. Thanks, Dad. I failed. I failed because of the fact that I'd put those pieces in point form, specifically. It was hugely liberating because I suddenly realized it, what the teachers thought of me didn't matter. It wasn't important what they thought. And it was a case of just get through this schooling and you'll be fine. Just get through it. Just, and at that time, that was a kind of an incentive to do the absolute minimum. Just get through and pass. Any more effort than that is a complete waste of time. And I'm telling you this story because soon after I took my, put my Rolex on my wrist, I met up with him again. And my good friend, Dirk, whom we had you know, shared these, these lovely adverts on National Geographic, his sister was good friends with Mr. McNeil's wife. And Dirk was there and we were meeting up on a Saturday morning or something and I drove over 
and this would have been in the middle of 1982 so I would have had the watch for probably one year or maybe a little bit more the reason why I know that is because I arrived in my Range Rover I bought my Range Rover in 1982 and it was a it, was, it looked exactly the same as the ones actually being sold, although it was 10 years old, and it was in really nice nick. It was beautiful. So now I arrive to collect Dirk, my friend, from Mr. McNeil's house, wearing my Rolex, driving a Range Rover, and I'm 22 years old. And I remember I, I, fl I flash, I was appalling and I even admit it now I was I wanted to I wanted to make sure that yeah, like this you know hello Miss McNeil how are you how nice to see you again would you like to know the time I can tell you the time I wonder uh, yeah, hello Mr McNeil uh, is Dirk here you know Dirk came out and you know and I could see the look on his face he was he was pretty dumbstruck you know but he, he was he was talking to me he was pretty dumbstruck and then it occurred to me he hasn't seen the Range Rover yet and <laughs> we opened the door, we walked outside, and there was the Range Rover, and we walked towards it, glanced into it. And I turned around and I looked at him, and he stood there. I was the loser, and I did very well after I left school. And it was easy to see it because I had no dependents, I was being paid well, I bought a Range Rover and a Rolex. And I remember the feeling, the feeling when <laughs> Dirk and I, because Dirk, he was also Dirk's teacher for a while. I didn't like him at all. I remember the feeling was <laughs> this, this immense satisfaction, triumph. I had triumphed over the school system. Second story was a little bit worse. Uh, again, it was very soon after. In fact, it was much sooner. It was actually just after I got the watch. Very soon after. It was a, it was a couple of days. And I remember my dad, I was still living at home. My dad came in to wake me up and he, and he saw my bedside table. And he remember him <laughs> picking it up and going, huh, and throwing it back down and walking out. But he did it in a very funny way. Um, I knew he was very proud of me. So... That evening, or the evening of the following evening, very, very close, uh, we had a family gathering. Now, my eldest brother had just got married, and for a wedding present, his new wife had bought him a very beautiful, very elegant Omega watch. It cost probably a fair amount of money. And we played a game of garden cricket. And after a while, Simon, that's my eldest brother, he, he looked at his Amiga and he said, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's got a few little water droplets on the inside of the, of the glass. And so I, I, I went and had a look at him and said, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit strange. He said, oh, oh, oh a, 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 any watch will do that. I said to him, I don't think any watch will do that. I, I, I don't think it's supposed to do that, actually. It's brand new. I, I don't think it should be doing that. No, 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 no. Any, any watch will do that. Any watch will do that. And he was very put out by this, you see. So here comes the bad part. We then went inside the house. It started to get dark, and I remember milling, the whole family was milling around, and there was the kit in the kitchen, there was a pot of peas boiling on the stove. And he was looking at his watch, and everybody was kind of discussing, oh, is that, is that right? Is that right? It's brand new. He just got it the same day, I think. And, oh, like this. and I said, look, it's not... It's not normal. I'm pretty sure it's not normal. Oh, yes, it is, Andrew. It is absolutely normal. So I took my watch off. <laughs> I plop and I dropped it in the peas, in the boiling peas. Shameful? Yes. My brother and I are very competitive. And it stems from early years, okay? And um, so you must remember this. I'm, I'm 21 when this happened, okay? So... I leave it in there for a few minutes and I said, do you think we sh do you think it's got any, uh, I, I think something like, how long do you think we should leave it in the pot before we check if there's any bubbles on the inside? And I knew boiling it for half an hour is not going to affect it. You know, it's that robust. And, uh, 
<laughs> I remember going to get a fork and put it, taking it out and then putting it under the tap because it was very, very hot and said, oh, look, no bubbles. Shameful, absolutely shameful. One of the questions uh, that uh, viewers have asked me about the watch is that do I wear it all the time? Because some of the connoisseurs of watches have said, well, that's a, that's a vintage, that's, that's worth a lot. And the fact is that it's actually worth more than a new one. I don't know why. It's very similar to the new one. It's the same size. Uh, it's more bulky. It's thicker. The new one has a flush face and a, and a, and a different crystal and etc. etc. and a different movement. But why is this more Why is it more valuable? I really don't know. But it is. It's it's a it's a little bit more valuable than a brand new one. I had the service when the pin broke in the strap, and it was almost exactly twenty years that I'd been wearing the watch when the pin broke had it serviced and I remember they gave it back to me and I said to them this isn't my watch. When I collected my watch after the service I remember asking if I could go in and have a look and look at their, their place and it was like a laboratory it was like it was sterile and they had all these machines with watches attached to them that were winding like they're simulating the, the winding action of wrists and arms. So that they would then leave them on these machines for a period of days and then make sure that they were, they were keeping good time. And he said to me, uh, would you like to see how this machine works? And it was a tubular, long tubular thing with a, full of water and a lever and uh, I didn't even know what it was. And I said, yes, he said, give me your watch. So I gave the watch back to him and um, he took off the, the strap and he attached this to something and lowered it into the water. He then pulled a lever down and there was a gauge and the gauge had a number of atmospheres. And he said, oh yes, your watch is about 20 years old. So we haven't uh, and I'm terribly sorry about this, uh, but uh, your watch is rated for 220 meters. Uh, it's no longer rated for 220. We thought we would just be a bit conservative about it, and we've set it at uh, 200 meters. I hope that's okay. And what they do with this thing is they pull the lever down, which simulates depth pressure in the water and then they jiggle it about because as they do that thousands of tiny bubbles wrap themselves around the watch and he shook it and he said if there is a leak in the watch we will see a tiny stream of minute bubbles coming from the watch itself and if we say no bubbles then we know that we have sealed the watch according to specifications and they do that he told me with every single watch that passes through their door. It was a new watch. It wasn't my watch. It was new, it, you know, and the, 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 uh, the crystal that it came with got scratched extremely easily. So after 20 years of use, it looked like it had been in a liquidizer. It, it was a mess. It was so badly scratched. It was, but it kept unbelievably good time. It, to the point where it wouldn't. It was. It was perfect. Uh, it, it would. It would last a whole year, and I would be able to say, "Okay, it's a New Year, Happy New Year, everybody," and it would be within a second, for twenty years. It was astonishing. It was never as good uh, since then. Never quite as good because they, 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 when they, they rebuilt the entire movement and they put all the different parts in and they put a new, new bezel on because the bezel was very faded. This one hasn't faded at all. That previous one had faded a lot in 20 years. Um, they, the, the, the face of the watch, the actual face itself, has uh, luminous dials. Now, these have been replaced because the previous luminous dials were actually an isotope. Some uh, it used to actually, you know, it was a radioactive material. So at, you know, four o'clock in the morning, pitched back, it would still glow in the dark. This doesn't anymore. And they rebuilt the watch and they didn't quite get it right because now it loses about, I would say, two minutes a week. Which for a mechanical timepiece is not bad. And of course it's wound by just the movement, the perpetual movement of my hand. And I take it everywhere with me. And I have, I remember I, after about two years of ownership, um, I, was, I had insured it. And I realized the pleasure of owning it 
It wasn't worth the money that I was spending. It was so expensive to insure that I thought to myself, I actually, if I, within approximately five years, I would be able to save enough money to buy another one. So if I lose one every five or six years, I can't remember, I've worked it out to be five or six years, um, I could buy another one. There's no point in, it's, there's just no point in, in insuring it. And soon after, it was within a few weeks of me cancelling the insurance, I was sailing, I capsized, I was climbing back onto the boat and it was very murky water and I felt something in my hand and I looked up and the watch had come undone. It's got a safety clip, but it needs adjusting every year or so, just a, just a slight adjustment on it, which I do myself. And it was actually, and I caught it like this. I was in a lake. And I, that was the closest I've ever come to, to losing it. If I am in a very crowded market, crowded place, um, and I feel threatened by it, I will actually put it into a back pocket and I will make sure the pocket is buttoned. I'll only ever put it in a buttoned pocket. I won't put it in a bag or anything else. And I've done that a few times uh, on my many travels where I felt this is not a good place to have a flashy watch. And it's not so much it's flashy, you know, sparkly, uh, but it, it, you can see quality from a distance. When I got the watch, I, it came in a, a beautiful solid oak box, beautiful box, gorgeous box. And again, my poor brother, because his Omega came in a kind of a vinyl covered plastic box. And of course I showed it off. But I tell you what I, about, shameless as this is, this is, I was very proud of my achievement, I guess. That's how I rationalize it to myself now. But in the little book that you get with your Rolex, it says you are now wearing one of the most impressive watches in the world and you know it. Your friends and acquaintances, both who already wear a Rolex and those who would like to have one, know it too. How's that for marketing? Well, I just lapped it up like milk. And if I think about everything that I own. I don't have anything. I have very few things that are that old and certainly nothing of value that is that old. I'm pleased to say I do not show it off. I do not flash it anymore. I don't feel need to flash it. In fact, I haven't done that for 30 years. It was probably the first five years uh, that I owned it that I was very, very aware that I had something very special on my wrist and I guess if one was a snob you can say well it was a sign of success well it, it, I guess it was that said it still feels very good owning it would I swap it for a new one not a chance not I'm not interested in a new one there was one time that I actually thought about, and I loved the new Breitlings that came out, and I actually considered swapping it for a Breitling. And amazingly, the man in the shop said, you are thinking about swapping that Rolex for a Breitling? And I said, well, I'm thinking about it. Yes, he said, don't do it. If I've ever, he said to me, and I quote, if I've ever seen seller's remorse, I'm staring it in the face right now. He said, the Breitling is a very fine watch. It is not a Rolex. Think about this, Claire. This was a salesman in a shop. I took his advice. And after that, I've never looked back. And that was, that was good 15, 20 years ago. So it was, it was a long time ago. Um, and I, I love it. It's a, it's a nice possession to own. Um, and in fact, I don't really use it much anymore, if you think about it. Because in the modern day, we've got phones and computers and everything us telling us the time but I feel completely naked without it. I hope you've enjoyed my little story. Thank you for watching.